Hello. Thank you. So, of course, as for tonight's team, I want to start with the big question that everyone is going to ask. Are we indeed all going back to the 1920s? Now, if we read through our newspapers, if we read through our news feeds, and if we see our smartphone updates, it often does feel as if the future, namely the 2020s, is just like the past. And when we look at the way we use the word populism, it seems to indicate that we're now returning not actually to the 2020s or a time of the future, but we're returning to the 20th century, the so-called midnight of the century, as people have called it, when a series of wars, immigration crises and refugee crises, but also xenophobic mass movements, mainly from the right, took control of states and governments and unleashed mayhem afterwards. Now, this has been going on mainly for four years, but I think it's good to put certain things in perspective here. So mainly since the Brexit and Trump votes of 2016, commentators and pundits, both in Europe and in America, have lamented the so-called rise of populism or even fascism as a return to those dark days of the mid 20th century. And they often treat the 2020s and the 1920s almost as perfect parables there. Yeah. So Trump, Salvini, Orban, and even Le Pen here seem to be the reincarnations of people like Hitler, Mussolini, or in the left-wing case, even Stalin. Now, what I want to argue in this talk, and this is an argument that quite runs counter to this literature or to this discourse we've seen mainly in the last five years, is that the comparison with the 1920s and the 1930s actually reveals as much as it hides. Now, although there definitely are some similarities between the two ver uh, various eras, there are also some important and very stark differences. And I want to go over them, the absence of mass parties, the absence of mass war mobilization, and the absence of a really strong and organized socialist or communist left. Now, if you really want to understand the common politics of the 2020s, then the 1920s, I claim, might actually be more useful as a contrast rather than as an example. And in this sense, I think we are forced to see our era precisely as that, namely ours. They are our 2020s. Now, <clears throat> even though someone like Biden has won the election or is hoping to win the election after the last recounts for Trump are over, and we look at, for example, Europe and uh, Jerry Baudet's party forum for democracies collapsing, and you can see declining numbers even for the Front National in France, um, few people are really confident that any of these trends are going to continue into the 2020s or into the next decade. Um, many people don't believe that the 2020s will be more liberal and more open than what came before. Certainly, if we look at the 1990s or the 2000s, which were the heyday of globalization, which were the heyday of a kind of liberalism that now mainly seems on the retreat. If we look at what gets published and what gets advertised in our bookshops, we definitely should feel vindicated when we see these apocalyptic visions. Now we have reams and reams of publishing which have been dedicated to the idea that we have entered a new 1930s or a new fascist era. Now, there are many examples here, I'm just going to mention some. You have the former state secretary, Madeleine Albright, who in 2017 published a book called Fascism, A Warning. And you have the Yale philosopher, Jason Stanley, who also put out a book on fascism as a hand guide while a very prominent historian such as Timothy Slider, who mainly works in Central Europe, has also jumped on this fascism train and has said that figures such as Putin, Trump, and even Marine Le Pen in France are all to be seen in the century as examples of the types of fascist threats we saw in the 20th century. Now, if we look closer to home, uh, in the Netherlands, for example, you have philosophers such as Rob Riemen, who's quite a prominent cultural critic, who already have talked for a fascism 2.0 since the last six years, originally referring to figures such as Geert Wilders and Jerry Baudet. Now, if you look at Jerry Baudet, who's now often been in the news because of the troubles his party finds himself and who's the embattled leader of the existing Forum for Democracy in the Netherlands, there is a sense in which it is true that there is a fascist side to Baudet. He has regularly boasted of his knowledge of certain fascist writers, um, he references them in some of his books um, and also in his speeches, there are moments when he does a type of dog whistling that does seem to signal his adherence to a certain fascist philosophy. Uh, some might say that is just transgression, as they call it, 
or they just do it for shock value. But at the same time, you can see he's at least curious about parts of this fascist legacy. As I said, a lot of this, what I'm talking about, certainly reminds us of the scary times we saw in the 1920s and in the 1930s. The xenophobia and the hatred for outsiders, the uneasy and sometimes, frankly, hostile relationship to certain liberal institutions or the idea of a separation of powers, but also the negation of the idea of a legitimate opposition or the idea that your political opponents are not just participants in a game in which you agreed on the rules, but are particularly loathsome or dangerous individuals that need to be eliminated sometimes or certainly don't even deserve to be considered as a legitimate opponent. So all of that has a dangerous 20th century ring to it. Now, of course, this feeling is reinforced by the circumstances that produce all these far right and these new extremist movements. Uh, we have rising inequality, we have a financial class that doesn't seem accountable for any of its actions since the 2008 crisis. Certainly the Corona crisis is massively the splitting society into a wealthy group of individuals who are able to gain all their wealth and other group of individuals who have less and less access to decent wages or decent public services. And all of that, as in the 1930s with the economic crisis that hit Germany, for example, does remind us of previous dark times in the 20th century. Now, nonetheless, I do want to insist that looking at the 1920s and the 1930s might actually be a mistake if you want to find out what happens in the present and confuse us or muddle us about what is happening today. And the first thing I want to talk about when we use the word fascism is that historically what fascism referred to was a very distinct, specific movement that was tied to that context of the 1920s and 1930s. This meant that fascism had very strong and large institution at its disposal in which it used to crush some of its very powerful opponents. Now, the most powerful of those opponents were, of course, the well-organized working class socialist and communist parties, um, which were found all across Europe, which the main example of it was Germany, in which the Nazis basically set themselves up as the caretaker for a German ruling class to finally get rid of the socialist and communist insurgents who were making it difficult for that ruling class to rule. Now, we have to realize that mainly in the 2020s and since the last few years, we really have none of those institutions left. Um, if we read around in political science, but also if you knew, look at the newspaper, you will see that mainstream parties and also socialist parties have actually lost massive amounts of members since the early 1990s at the earliest. Um, our party landscape is becoming more and more fragmented. There are more and more parties, more and smaller parties with a lot of smaller challenges on the right, which are growing, although there are some challenges on the left as well. And these are pushing against the dominance of a certain traditional mainstream. But it's important also to remember that those parties hardly do that push with larger constituencies or voting and member bases than those mainstream parties. Um, if you look, for example, at Flanders Belang, or you look at Forum for Democracy in the Netherlands, or you look at the PVV, which is actually another real party, they might have members and they might have people who knock on doors for them, but they don't do that with numerical amounts of members, which are in any way reminiscent of the 1930s, or will assemble the numbers that can be given by traditional parties who are in a very, very deep crisis already. Now, of course, one possible counter argument here is that, well, some of these parties might not have a lot of members, but they do have a very online following. There was no internet in the 1920s and the 1930s. There was the press, there was um, all kinds of uh, book circulations, but they didn't have that digital tool that today proves so powerful when you're trying to create support for your political movement. Certainly when we look at places such as 4chan, look at Reddit, with a very, very rich extreme right YouTube conspiracy scene, the number of followers and subscribers people have on Twitter, the fact that um, the leader of Vlaams Belang in Belgium now has its own TikTok account, the fact that Dries van Langenhove's Instagram account is in um, immense popularity, does give the sense that the politics of large numbers or the politics of large fascist movements is still with us or returning, but specifically on the internet. And remember, perhaps in Belgium, the scandal surrounding the so-called Pano report on Dries van Langenhove, in which the Verte or the public broadcaster found out his membership of this chat group, which was full of racist and extremist content. And it does seem to indicate that the new illiberal or far-right politics mainly flourishes online. 
Um, and we've seen this already in the vocabulary that is so typical of the internet with words such as normies or libcucks or the theory of a kind of great replacement in which the West uh, white societies are being replaced by immigrants. The web certainly is a very hospitable hub or very hospitable environment for a new type of extreme right politics. Now, we also have to remember that appearances do deceive. Um, in contrast to the fascist organization of the 1920s and 1930s I talked about, so mass parties, paramilitary groups, the so-called exit costs or the price you pay once you leave these online organizations is very minor and practically insignificant compared to these previous ones. Uh, that means that the kind of organization, the kind of groups that flourish in the internet are extremely voluntary. And so as anyone who's been in a Facebook group or has been on Twitter, it certainly has fairly real life concrete consequences on people's careers, but leaving them is not nearly as costly or not nearly as hard as some of those other associations were. So the new right flourishes in comment sections, it flourishes on digital streams and in Facebook groups, but it simply doesn't have the same capacity for mobilization, except when it comes to clicks and ratings. Now, if you look at the US and we look away from Europe, of course, we do see that there is some paramilitary side to some of these movements, just like we saw insane street violence in the 1920s and 30s, when you had police, communists and fascists all fighting in the streets and shooting each other. Um, and in the US, for example, the recent Black Lives Matter protests over the summer have called for the formation of so-called right-wing militias and the Proud Boys and the Boogaloos, which remind us of the fascist death squads that roamed around Europe in the post-war period. But this also brings us to another key difference with the 1920s, namely, and that is the absence of a war. Now, fascism was really born in the wake of a massive mobilization in the context of a world war. Now, today we live in a world in which war has mainly disappeared, mainly from Europe and the United States. It has been professionalized, or it's been outsourced to paid mercenaries. Or in the US, uh, the army mainly serves as a kind of buffer for a lot of uh, very poor citizens who can't afford to uh, buy themselves an education if they don't get into the army. We also, of course, know that America, for example, is awash with guns. Uh, it's got an enormous amount of people who own firearms at home. But that does not necessarily mean that, as in the 1920s and 1930s, a lot of people have experience with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, people might play all kinds of games on their consoles, including the incels, as they're called, or the involuntary celibates who have joined the alt-right, but they hardly know anything about the street violence we saw in the 1920s. And I think we can also see that the far right itself realizes this is because there's a deeply performative or visual side to the way they do politics, in which they mean they have to film and stream and record all of their meetings on social media to actually inflate and give a sense of importance to the fact that they are gathering not the largest audience possible. And I think this is something which is not specific to far right movements in that sense, but it's also a problem that occurs for massive protest movements that have rocked other parts of the political spectrum, such as the recent Extinction Rebellion actions or the massive Black Lives Matter protests that shook the planet over the summer. And what you have there again is a notion of a very voluntary form of group in which people join uh, certain specific groups, but rather for vague slogans, which they don't really know what kind of policy they entail. So for example, after the George Floyd protests, we saw that loads of people put black squares on their Instagram pages which, of course, um, spoke to a real moral concern about the horrific police treatment that a lot of black Americans mainly suffer and how that treatment mirrors the police treatment of other minorities across Europe and across the world. Yet we also know that Instagramming or just changing a profile picture on Instagram is very cheap and easy. Uh, it takes about 30 seconds to put a black square on your profile picture, and we can easily let go of that commitment later on. So it is this increasingly uncommittal or liquid society, if I want to say, in which all our commitments and beliefs seem temporary and easily suspendable, on which this current new fashion actually thrives. So again, the 1920s, yes, perhaps, but also mainly no. We do live in very, very different times. So we should not just compare ourselves with the 1930s and 1920s, which are often pinpointed as previous episodes of populist or fascist success. Um, Europe today faces a massively demobilized citizenry, which has little experience of combat. Um, it doesn't take part in large-scale electoral or elections, um, and it has no memory of state-driven violence. 
Now, fascism, in contrast, was a response to a socialist threat. Um, the recent opening up of democratic means of expression and had a very large paramilitary uh, presence. The fascism we know today, or the populism we know today, actually arises in a completely different set of contexts. Uh, people don't go to elections as much as they do. There is falling voter participation, um, and <clears throat> the types of economic policy that accompanies are also completely different. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that today might not be dangerous or that there are not things we need to take into account and that there are no dangerous forces on the horizon for which we should look out. But they are dangerous in a different way than what we saw in the 20th century. And this is the most important thing I think you can take from studying political science. Not all bad things are the same. Um, and although the 2020s might mean we go back to the 1920s, they will also remain our decade. So we have to assume that mainly it's our future. Thank you very much.